This is Twit. It wasn't too long ago that we had the GTX 1660 Ti launch. And everybody, you know, you have to know that when the TI cards hit, there's got to be a counterpart without the TI. And of course, that's what we got today. What would the, Yeah. And they've got to hit their price points. It's all about product segmentation, as I'm learning. And it's not the most glamorous or exciting thing, but that's the reality of uh, the graphics card world. But let's get right into it. The cards that I got in very similar to what we had last time with the 1660 Ti launch here at the site, which is MSI sent us an overclocked version and EVGA sent us a stock version. So we got a look at both sides there. And what you get with the 1660, with the non-TI, is very much the TI all over again, or at least that's what I thought at first glance. Because if you're going over the specs, you're like, okay, it's... Uh, Still TU-116, same core uh, touring architecture. It goes from 24 down to 22 SMs, which means 128 fewer CUDA cores. So you do have less uh, you know, GPU power at your disposal, but higher clocks. 1785 megahertz is the uh, default boost clock on this. And almost every partner card is going to be overclocked to some extent. We'll talk about that later, but... The big change is if, if you look at the memory, and it's still six gigabytes of memory, even on this cheaper card, but it's GDDR5 memory. So we're going all the way back to the GTX 1060, which this is effectively just straight up replacing. You know, Patrick, we talked about the, was the 1660 Ti kind of the replacement for the 1060? That was sort of my narrative with the last review. This just straight up is. Like, this is dropping right <laughs> into that $219 price point where we've seen some of the six gigabyte 1060 cards selling for. Kind of that 220 right. to 230 range is where they ended up. And here it is. This is a card that NVIDIA said would be about 15% faster than a 1060 six gigabyte, mm -hmm. which it is. It actually was a little bit greater than that. They seem to be understating the the gains a little bit. But it was very much game dependent how much you were actually getting. I saw gains of up to 27% over a, a 1060 at 1080p. Or if you go to the most AMD friendly benchmark, which is Ashes of the Singularity, that was only a 2.5% increase over the older Pascal card. So averaged out to somewhere between about 15 and 20% of a boost. And that's, you know, for $219, if you, if you look at the review and if, if you look at reviews out there, I, I have in the mix an older 900 series card, the top end 980 Ti from that era. And this card at 1080p isn't too far off from a 980 Ti in most of the games, Ashes of the Singularity being the big uh, outlier there. But... It's it's pretty remarkable to me to see how a card that retails for two hundred nineteen dollars, mm -hmm. and I was testing at ten eighty p. I was just testing this base model from EVJ, which is at that two nineteen mark, right. is actually better than a nine eighty Ti. That's kind of crazy to me. So I mean, this is how far we've come. <laughs> well, so but yeah, it's also yes, a nine eighty Ti was a six hundred and fifty dollar GPU at launch in the like the summer of twenty fifteen. That was a long time ago. <laughs> that was well, yeah, it was four years ago. That's that's ancient in computing terms. That's that's generations, eons. That's that's you know nations rise and fall in computer terms in four years. So, part of me wants to say like, gosh, couldn't it be just a little bit faster? Uh, which makes me yes. sound like the comments uh, below the review, but. You know, I'm I, I I I'm I'm listening to you. You're sort of half stoked about this card yeah i think you didn't get stoked about this card until you saw the performance compared to what used to be a 650 fifty dollar card because yeah, you kind of I mean, seem like it you know it's exactly it's, this is it's, the card to buy if you don't have any money or if, you know if, if if the most amount of money you can scrape together is 200 bucks but should people try to scrape up to get a a, a 1660 ti or is this kind of like the choice for 1080p gaming now if you if you look at the, the TI, the performance level of the right. TI, which is is $60 more, right? Uh, 
And the cards, what I've been seeing as far as pricing goes, is they're ranging between 219 and 249 at the high end. Okay. So 249 is still uh, $30 less than a, a the TI version. But $30, I mean, if you're if you're that close, you'd think, well, why not just go the rest of the way? But a $249 card uh, is going to be significantly overclocked from the factory. Most right. of these are going to have overclocking potential beyond that. I know we talked about overclocking last week with the uh, RTX 2060 XC Ultra card, but it's become pretty obvious with these cards. This TU116 GPU, it's extremely OC friendly. And right. they've left a lot of performance on the table with this card. So if you are looking around, if you're shrewdly examining some of the overclocked results out there in reviews and looking at some of the factory overclocked cards and the, the clock speeds they offer out of the box, you can get really close to the TI with a fairly uh, easy overclock. And right. while GDDR5 memory does not overclock as well as GDDR, GDDR6, from what we've mm -hmm. seen so far, it you can still you know boost it pretty significantly. I got 400 megahertz out of out of mine. Oh, and uh, out of the out of the memory, and about 150 right. out of the core. Okay. And using the uh, the higher end card that we got in, this was the MSI card, which has a its own custom PCB, beefier power delivery. I was sustaining those overclocks uh, under load. And consistently over two gigahertz under load, where that pushed me up to and even past in some instances, uh, even MSI's factory overclocked 1660 Ti from the last review. Mm -hmm. So if if you're just That's buying impressive. it, yeah, and, and I was very surprised because I thought memory bandwidth would play a bigger role, and there's no way to overcome the disparity between GDDR5 and six. With overclocking, because it can't be overclocked that far. Like the the memory at 12 gigabits per second is going to be impossible to reach when you're starting off with 8 gigabit per second GDDR5. Right. But 1440p I, overclocking testing. If you if you're looking at the video, it jumped like three, four places in the chart and was right up there with the 1070 again. So it's, like it's faster with, than my 1070. Delete expletive. Yeah. Well, so, okay, it seems like as we look at this, you know, 100 and, 100 and you know, 28 CUDA cores doesn't make that big a difference at 1080p. Uh, the huge, you know, it's like 90 gigabytes per second edition, almost not quite double, nowhere near double, like a third more, you know, it's uh, more than a third more uh uh, almost like 50% more bandwidth in terms of memory bandwidth doesn't seem to make a difference. It's just it's interesting for me to because we, we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of tests over the last years. Gamers Nexus a couple years ago did an amazing look at like okay you know one dim versus two dims and you know, looking at at memory speeds. And one of the takeaways for me was that is like boy. You know, following manufacturers' recommended locations and, you know, pairing of memory and motherboards makes for really fast memory benchmarks, which almost never trans into any measurable real-world performance when you're looking at, at, at application-level benchmarks. And it's interesting to see on a GPU because I'm with you, right? It's like, oh, it's, it's got this huge amount of memory bandwidth. It's got another 128 CUDA cores. It, sh it feels like it should be much faster than it is. Um, this is great. This is like AMD CPUs years ago where you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to turn this into a part that's worth twice as much. Um, right. And without cool. <laughs> even having to use like a pencil to trace out, you know, that the bridge that trace like with the Athlon XPs or the was it the Thunderbird? But this may be yeah, triggering I mean, for some people in our audience. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> if you if you had any issues with parts back in the day involving pencils uh, and various other problems with modifications um i digress you were saying i i just i love stuff that that has this much headroom where it even with the stock card i took the stock evg card right. which i have right here which is once again one of those really compact but very thick like three slot little cards which is kind of growing on me i was i had my reservations at first because i'm like why would you want a card this small if it had if it has to have three slots but doesn't take up much room inside your case and it runs very, very quiet. 
And I'm thinking because this heat sink is so big, why not try pushing this one, even though it's not made for overclocking? And I ran the OC scanner, which is just an automated uh -huh. overclocking tool from NVIDIA, which is built into like Afterburner and EVGA's Precision X1. I ran it and, you know, left the room, come back 20 minutes later. It's like you get plus 143, which doesn't directly translate into a, a, a touring overclock because they go in 15 megahertz increments, but still plus 135 or plus 150, somewhere in there. And I was conservative and went plus 135. And I was still getting close to two gigahertz, over 1900 megahertz, consistent, sustained boost clocks and game testing. So even a bone stock card with a 100% power limit locked still leaves a lot of performance on the table where the manufacturers, if they really wanted to, could release these cards with a factory overclock of, you know, say 1900 megahertz boost and probably get pretty close to sustaining it even without uh, giving you a bigger power limit. So I'm just kind of guessing here, but it seems like TU116 could have been clocked a lot more aggressively and perhaps may not have been to keep kind of the product segmentation, the spacing between the GPUs a little bit cleaner. Like, you know, it's very, it's a big jump to get up to that 2060 from a 1660 Ti until you overclock the Ti and it's just as fast. So. I'm excited. I'm officially excited. And also they are not showing up yet on Amazon.com. Our several are still in stock, including from EVGA and Asus on Newegg.com. Oh, I sense overclocking in my future. <laughs> yeah, I just want to find, just like before, I want to find the card with the highest power limit and just go nuts. Because another thing, these still have an 8-pin power connector on them. Even though it's just a 120-watt card, even though it draws less power even than the GTX 1060, mm -hmm. it's got this 8-pin connector that's just begging you to make use of it because that gives you 150 watts from your PSU plus board power. So you can, well, you know, you could potentially exceed uh, or get close to, yeah, you could exceed 200 watts with this card. And I think I did because I got it's close to like the 280, 290 range, full like system power from the wall with a Core i7 when I was overclocking this thing. So uh, there's a lot of thermal headroom. There's, depending on the, you know, the partner card's design, there's definitely going to be, uh, you know, I would say most of these cards are going to give you between 90 and 120 megahertz or more above stock boosts. So anyway. Just realize I can't fit that EVGA in my uh, in the uh, system I wanted to put it in because <laughs> it's because it's three slots, right? Yeah, I don't know of any mini ITX cases that, that have card. three slots. There might, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly none buy, that I already own. <laughs> yeah. So Asus may be in my, my near future. Uh, I, I sense Editor's Choice Gold Award. How did this fare out? The Yeah, the I gave the Gold Award to the, the EVGA card because it's just a solid card, did everything right, nothing really wrong with it, and it's that, that stock 219 price and still had overclocking potential. But the MSI card, which I was actually beating a 1660 Ti with without any voltage mm -hmm. modifications, uh, I had, I struggled with that. Actually, I, apparently I gave that the gold. I was thinking that editor's choice. I may have to go in and change that, but the, it's, it's $30 more, but I felt the difference in price was more than offset by the fact that you have so much OC potential, but I think that's just kind of inherent to this product Chip. where right. we'll see other cards out there like EVGAs and ASUS and others, which are probably going to be hitting some of these aggressive clocks fairly easily. So it's, it's just a really good it, it becomes so much more interesting when we start talking about over overclocking. If this was just a stock card and you couldn't overclock it, and this was like at its limit already, it's not interesting, honestly, right. because it's just a drop-in replacement for the 1060 as Pascal kind of dries up, and then this replaces it, and you get about 15% more performance. But it's been almost two years. That card came out in July of 2016. So you'd expect more performance by most now. aged. <laughs> 